Welcome to another edition of the Big Head Pod here on the Dub Network. Today's show is brought to you by Herman Marshall Whiskey, Dallas County's first distillery of handcrafted award-winning small batch whiskey, patiently aged in new white oak barrels in the great state of Texas. Built from the grain up, just like good whiskey and better friends should be. They have a bourbon, a rye, and a blend, and they are also building a brand new facility that should be opening sometime this spring, so you guys get a chance to check it out. Please do so, because this is some good stuff, especially this time of year with the cold weather. Nothing better than a little bit of warm whiskey. And welcome to another edition of the Big Head Pod here on the Dub Network. Today is a special day. One, it's this gentleman's Robert Nesta Marley's birthday, so... Happy birthday there, Mr. Bob Marley, greatest reggae singers that I love to listen to. So, uh, happy birthday to you. And today, my guest, former Texas Ranger, he is now a hitting coach for the Boston Red Sox and will be a hitting coach for the Dominican Republic in the World Baseball Classic, Mr. Luis Ortiz. Luis, how are you, sir? And awesome, man. So good to be with you. I know. It's been forever. Those days we were in the uh, in the old batting cages out in the snow with a roof trying to take, just trying to get loose before the winter time, before spring training. And uh, we've come a long way, haven't we? Long way. <laughs> been <laughs> indeed. It is. So now, so, um, so the last few years you were hitting coach with Texas, correct? Yeah. And then with, and now you're with Boston, correct? Yeah. So I was, uh, I was uh, with the Dodgers, then the Rangers, then the Red Sox. Then the Red Sox, okay. So is that has that always been a dream for you to be a hitting coach, or have you just wanting to be a manager, or is this you know everybody has their own little their ideas yeah. of what they want to do? So what what was your idea? Does, I mean, has hitting been your always been your thing, or if, are you looking for the bigger goals down the road? Well, I mean, you know, when you play. Sometimes you get stamped a certain role, and mine has always been hitting. You know, he's like, oh, yeah, he's a good hitter, but defense, a uh, little <laughs> shaky, whatever. So when I started coaching, I didn't want the stigma attached to me. He's just a hitting guy. So believe it or not, I was preparing myself to be a minor league director. That's what I wanted. I wanted to run an organization, try to – help our coaches get better and of course develop as many big leaguers as we can but not only big leaguers but big league men i think we owe it to the parents when we get those young guys into the system to send them back better than than they gave it to us so that's actually was my what i thought was my path i mean i went from hitting coordinator with the rangers to hitting coordinator and cultural development coordinator with Cleveland, which uh, helped transition the foreign players to a easier life in the, the States. Then the following year I was a system field coordinator and hitting coordinator. Then AJ Preller called me um, with San Diego and I became the field coordinator and the hitting coordinator. So I was helping run the, the organization overall, but also targeting the hitting side. And I was there for three years. I was thinking that that was my path. And then the Dodgers called and said, hey, do you want to be one of our hitting coaches? So I was like, oh, okay, let's do that. Um, and then I was there for a year. The third base coach of the Dodgers was uh, Woody. Um, and... He said, hey, do you want to go home? Do you want to come help me? <laughs> so I came to the Rangers for three years and, um, you know, happens what normally happens to hitting coaches. Um, got let go and have been on my second year with the Red Sox. So the hitting, you know, the hitting side of it, it's always, it's always evolving, right? And is it, you know, the, the organizations you've been with, what what has changed from from when you first started to now? Is it more of a philosophy from the front office down? Is it more of the the players themselves? What are you noticing more than anything? Well, you know, they talk about 
old school, new school. And I was talking to my really good friend, Tony Diaz, he coaches with the twins. And we talk about, we are in school. Like we continue to learn. Like it's not old school, new school. It's like we're in school. And I think um, we have been inundated by a tsunami of information. And for good reason. I think we want to find out why things happen. I think we have a good grasp of how things happen, what is happening. We can see it. But now we're measuring it. And of course, the old school stuff that survived, there's a lot of wisdom on that. There's a reason it survives because this is mm -hmm. is good foundational stuff. I think what we had learned a little bit more is how to quantify what's happening. And I think when it's something new, you're gonna you're not gonna feel that comfortable. I think it, it affects the old guard and a lot of the new guard that maybe are no as experienced or didn't play, then they come in because they know the technology or they know the information and there's a little bit of a clash. But I think that some of the changes, I mean, of course, the information is, is unbelievable. I mean, how much stuff we 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 get in, in a single day, just sometimes too much. But I think it's like a doctor. I think a, a doctor go to school for eight years, 80% of the time, it's probably going to be a hey, rest, take an aspirin, you know, don't do too much. But that 10% at each end, if you need the information, you at least went through it. And I think that's what happens with coaching now. We just have a lot of information to try to help as many people as we can. The biggest role is how you translate the information. So this biggest spectrum of players, you know, you got Dominican kids from that didn't even go to sixth grade that are very talented. And then you have um, some Ivy League players that graduated from, from my advanced degrees. And now you're trying to get the same information to both of the streams. So that's probably the hardest part about what's been happening. I think um, technology, information, analytics have really propelled pitching and defense. Um, I don't... I don't think it, I mean, it has helped some on the hitting side, but hitting is such a reactive event. And until we crack the code of the mind and the eyes, I think we, we're still going to have the same struggles that we have. Yeah, so you're under the philosophy of, of less is more than type of, because, you know, you, you, know, we've, you know, you and I've talked about this, where they get, these kids are, you talk about too much information of where, it's almost like a brain scramble where they, they, they're not even, they can't even think anymore. They have to be kind of be told what they need to do, certain situations, how to handle it, how to think, as opposed to just letting the natural athletic ability take over. Are you noticing that more now than when you first started uh, as a hitting coach? Well, I think I, I, I'm not necessarily into the less is more or more is good or whatever. I'm more into the targeted. Like some guys need more information. I think the less talented you are, the more probably you need to compete. I think the more talented you are, the more surgical you got to be with information. It has to be very direct and very small because you don't, like you said, you don't want paralysis by analysis. You want guys to be free. That's why you got these thoroughbreds. You want them just to run. The, the problem, I think, is that especially if you didn't have that experience playing at, at, at a high level, you kind of measure everybody with the same rule, a ruler. And and I think that's where the discrepancies are. That's what the the challenges are with some of the coaches that they say, yeah, it's kind of like my way of the highway of, of my credibility is coming from this technology instead of having the empathy and understanding, you know, this kid came from the Dominican. He didn't sit down in a school for 12 years, like the kids in the States. So you got to be a little more simple. And that doesn't mean that you don't build them up to, to acquire a knowledge that eventually is going to help him as he get older and, and he's not moving as well. But you also have to understand that, you know, we're all different. And that's and that's hard. And that's the, the hard part of whether it's teaching, 
in school or, or any sport, it's it's baseball hitting is the most probably individualized aspect of the game because like you said, some guys need more, some guys need less. But I think the collectively they put them together and they try and create this this mold and you can't you can't mold guys, you know. You, you can't have people trying to hit like Aaron Judge that are five foot eight, right? You, you, and, and vice versa. You can't teach that, and you see that. So you've, I mean, you've worked with with Rudy Harmia, who I think is probably the best that's ever been in baseball, right? Rudy studied the game and he simplified it. And so, so see, you know, yeah. learning from Rudy, you know, and and the other guys you've been around, and um, so in Rudy's philosophy was, I do remember in spring training he would meet with. Right, all the minor league hitting guys, right? Is that the hitting coaches and kind of be on the same page? Is that is that true? Yeah, I mean, he tried to synchronize his five steps. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the way, the way I look at it, though, I think it has to be a manual for the coaches and a paragraph or a page for the player. And I think just being able to expand. So, you know, I think sometimes we assume that the other person should know what I know because I'm making it clear, but I think it's just, it's just one of those things that, that Rudy was really good, but I think this, there's two common denominators on, on good coaches, especially hitting coaches is good communication skills and good players. You still have to have the, the guys like, like the guys that that he had. Not not to take away from him, but is you got to have good players, and and you know he was he was a good. He lasted a long, long time. I don't know how well he would do now, um, just because of the expectations that they are not the knowledge or the person i'm just saying that there's different expectations that we know rudy rudy was a very strong-minded individual that believed poor harley what he what he taught yeah and rudy never he didn't change much with with guys swings unless it just wasn't working you know you talked about the philosophies that he had um and you've been around different different hitting coaches right and you talk about that learning curve of learning from um yeah. from Rudy, you know, pieces from Rudy and, and the other guys that, that stand out. So so the philosophy then that, that you bring to uh, to Boston, you brought from, you know, from uh, uh, L.A. to to, Bo- to here, to Boston. Now, so what, you know, what is what is your big philosophy? What, what, what do you really look for as a hitting coach as far as what you're trying to accomplish with your guys? Like you said, because there's, like you said, there's so much information and you're trying to, to navigate this old school, new school philosophy. So what, you know, what is, what is your take on all that? Yeah. I mean, I think for me, the philosophy is what helps the particular player. I think you got to individualize it as much as you can. You got to know a little bit about everything because you might have been a very good rotational hitter, but you needed to stay through the ball better. So you got to, you know, you got to target that. Where some guys were more pushy, so you got to teach them how to rotate a little better. So it just, to me, um, I first start with what called the ATM. ATM of, of hitting is, you know, you got to approach timing and mechanics. And of course, mechanics is how the body moves. You want to make the guy as efficient as he can be. Then time is how the eyes work. How can I predict when the boy is going to get to my hitting zone so I can make a good decision? And the approach is, is basically the, the, the plan that I have to be able to see the situation, what the game is asking me to do, and try to counterattack what the ego wants, which is always going to be our battle. What the, what the game is asking me versus the ego. I want to get paid. I want to, I want to be the hero, feel this. So what do I do? So mechanically, I think about five things. I, I'm very big into five things. And and I know, like you said, and at, at the major league level, you're not coaching as much. You are reminding, there's a reason why those guys are there. You're reminding guys, guys get tired, guys get hurt, um, guys get contract situations. Yeah. So it's 
too much, so it's understandable. So, but for me, number one, and it has to be with the timing aspects that you got to move to see the ball. You just can see the ball and then move. Uh, the game is so fast now. So you almost have to be like a wide receiver. You got to anticipate a good pitch to hit. And it's a yes, yes, no kind of thing. Instead of like, let me see if it's a good pitch to move or you're going to be late. The second one is you got to land in a good position to hit. You got to, no matter what, I think the most important part is that launching position because it tells you what your thoughts were before you make to that to get to that posture position, but also is going to be the what's going to cause what's going to happen when you swing the bat. Uh, the third one is is I call it connection with direction. It basically is you know my arm and my bat are away from my body. I wanted to get all my muscles, everything tied up, so I can make really good contact. Um, I think of power is the, is the combination of by speed and strength. I mean we talk about timing. Timing is me hitting the ball, the fastest part of my swing with the hardest part of the bat with my body in a good position to hit. So if I don't have that, I can have a really fast swing, but if I'm hitting out in front or, or late, then I'm wasting that, that good swing. The fourth one is that I wanna make contact, uh, I call it 91. I mean, I think uh, my arm, at a 90 degree angle is the strongest that you can be as I start to extend and push. So I wanna go from 90, 91 and extend through it. So I can and go to and through the baseball. I wanna be as, as efficient as I can to transfer as much energy as I, that I have, that I, I kept into my load as in, in the launching position and then transferring to the ball. And then the fifth one is Final destination, you got to finish your swing. You got to, the essence of hitting the ball hard is, is by speed. You got to swing the bat fast. You got to move it. Um, you might fix some bad decisions, but bad swing decisions with a bat that is fast. I think that's what those guys that have been really good bad ball hitters, they, they never slow down. The swing, the ball was in the way of the swing instead of the swing in the way of the ball. So let's have five kind of, Thanks. I know um, Rudy has his five steps. Yeah, we we had um, see the ball, landing in a good position to hit, people in transfer and all that. I think to me, just because of the game is so fast, a lot has to do with timing and, and being able to to move the body at the, at the right time so it magnifies the chances that you're doing damage. And a lot of that comes from, from you actually studying you know your your hitters that are on the team do a lot of guys you know when we played we were we asked a lot of questions of especially the veteran guys right you know what they were feeling because we would take different pieces of you know what they were told right because not everything is going to stick with what what we hear but we take different pieces of it and and learn from those guys you know being around them from you know and then you know, like you said at the major league level you're there to kind of just polish hey i'm not feeling this okay let's get a little bit of work in let's just see how we're feeling doing this do you see more guys now not asking as many questions as they did when we were playing I uh, yes i mean i think you know i think the coach has three roles i think the number the first role is is teacher and a teacher I'm giving you new information and you're listening you're just absorbing what I'm telling you then an instructor is almost like a feedback loop like I tell you one thing you tell me how you feel and we go back and forth and then the third one is coaching and coaching is more happens more in the game right it's almost the players that one leading the coach you know so this you know what do you think do you you know and and out in front, you know, like they, they're actually leading the way. I think that's what happens a lot with with the big leagues. The guys have acquired an experience and a knowledge that, that they trust. I mean, every decision that they make, and I have to be very mindful of that, is a business decision. It can be worth millions and millions of dollars, both 
in a loss or as a gain. So you got to be very, very mindful. Now, with that amount of financial security they, that they have, they have guys on the side that they trust and they they know that these guys is, even though, like I, I told the Red Sox, they, we had a mini camp two weeks ago. And I was telling the guys that, you know, I love you guys, but I love my daughters more than I love you. <laughs> so the, the, the way my daughters are going to survive is if I give you the best information possible. But when they go pay somebody else, it's a sense of ownership that they have. And I think what Rudy had when we play was that Rudy had, even though he didn't have an, a true assistant like we have now, we have a hitting coach, a head hitting coach, and now most teams have two assistants, is that he had 12 assistants. We were all coaching each other, helping each other out. We had that relationship. So there was no leaving the the stadium one minute after the shower. You know, we stay, we talk, we kind of figure out what happened. And there was a lot more conversations happening, which you gave me some of you know, hey, I saw this with this guy. Now, you know, you have, because of the information is already av available, you you can go to a site like True Media, for example, that a lot of players have access to, and you can see where I'm getting pitched and where people are are playing me. So maybe I can help myself a little bit. So there's a more one-on-one. -on -one. A lot had to do with you know how technology have made that phone and the iPad such an individual event that that interaction player player is doesn't happen as often as, as when we played. Do you think that's good or bad for the game itself? You know, I think as, as, a, as players, you know, that was the way we, like you said, we learned. We were watching the game, but we were also, you know, on the, on the rail talking about, hey, you know, I got pitched this way. You know, they, they've done this, right? And if we noticed something, you know, we'd run over and, and, and talk to Rudy or we'd tell somebody who was the on deck hitter going up, hey, we're, we're noticing this, this, and this. Do you think it's, it's helping or it's, you think it's hurting the game itself? Well, I think, actually, I wrote a protocol the last year because I would see <laughs> these young guys come in and have no clue of how to behave in a major league environment. And one of them, like you said, it says, you finish my bat, I go to my to the iPad, and only think it about me. I know watching the game, I know watching what the pitcher's doing to, the, to my teammates. I remember I always have one or two guys that was so close to him. They're watching me, and they were kind of like, for me, it was kind of like Rudy assistant hitting coach. Because Rudy, you know, had a lot of stuff in his mind. There's a lot of stuff going on, and he has nine guys they have to worry about. But if we figure out that I'm dipping or dropping like that, you know, I don't know when it's happening so fast during the swing. So I would look at my friend and say, hey, you know, keep the shoulder up. And we would try to coach each other even within at bat. So I think it's cyclical. I think we went from very, um, like our, our time, which is very united team and, and teaching each other and, and guys would give us some of their knowledge and we transfer it to the next one to a more, I'm not going to say selfish, but individualistic kind of way, I think it's going to go back to kind of like a hybrid. I think we've seen it with the managing situation where we were having managers that never manage a, even a game in the minor leagues. And now you have Dusty Baker and you got Skinner and Snicker in, 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 in Atlanta. I mean, you got these old school guys and now they're in the World Series and winning it. So it's like, you know, I think that, that that's going to be the, the blend. I think there's a push to be more as a, as a team. I think the Dodgers have done a great job on that. You can see how they, it's like they genuinely like each other. You know, it's like you see how winning teams behave. And I think when you have a nine-headed monster, like I, I, I tell my guys, we have to make a choice. Are we gonna have one team of 13 or 13, 13 teams of, of one? And that's always gonna be the challenge, especially in that environment. 
And you can tell right away when you get into into camp and everything else and just, you know, like you said, as coach, it's it's about us kind of sometimes just taking a step back and absorbing what we see, what we hear from guys of knowing, all right, this guy's going to be a problem or, or not. So, I mean, you know, you, you see that you get that feel correct as you go in because you go into camp in the you're going into, you know, you're leaving for the World Baseball Classic here soon. But then you get into spring training and you're dealing with what 50 40 guys that are hitters and you now you've got to figure out like these different flot these guys what they so i mean to ex- talk about that challenge of just trying to understand i mean you know you have your guys right but sometimes yeah. do you talk to them as saying or do they understand knowing that uh, like rafael devers for, for instance that he's gonna kind of help with what you're doing with some of the other guys because you can't watch everybody at once. Do, do guys understand that? Or is that something that you really have to go and tell them to say, Hey, can you help me with this? I think some guys, and I think that's why building a culture is so expensive. You see the expensive in, in finance financially, because guys like that are very expensive to mm-hmm. get expensive in time because to develop that culture takes a long a long time it takes took houston three or four years of losing 100 games to get to where they are not nobody remembers that you look at tampa went through the same thing so that's the challenge you either do the yankees way and you pay 300 million to gary cole and those guys and try to build it like that or you got to wait it out and if you're going to wait it out then you need patience and you need discipline in the way that if that guy doesn't match what we're trying to do, it's some cost. Get rid of him. And I think sometimes front offices trying to save face might delay that decision that should, should be made. And that's always going to be the challenge. I mean, we think that we're going to change somebody but we can only build an environment where change can happen, but that person, the individual, have to be the one that changes. I, I have these metrics in my head when I look at, at people. I said, if you have, if you, you talk about the relationship between nature, how the person behaves, or nurture the environment. And I think of if, if the kid is a bad nature kid in a bad environment, there's hope. Because maybe you put in a better environment, he might be able to overcome some of the. There's a reason why he might have been like that, and he just needed a better place to to live and and, and work. The second one is if you have a bad nature kid in a good environment, you got to get rid of him quick. They have to be some really bad event, a life event event, for them to change, because if they're already a bad individual in a really good environment, then what is to do, you know? Now you have good nature kids in good environment. Like your your kids, my kids, they were, they were given opportunities. They're gonna be called privileged because they're gonna get opportunities to graduate college and do different stuff. I mean, they took advantage. It's a lot of challenges, but they were in a good environment. And then a good nature kid in a bad environment, then those those guys change the world. I mean, you see some of these kids from the Dominican or whatever, you know, you, they behave the right way. Now they're given opportunities and they take off. So I think that's the way I look at it. I think sometimes we don't, as an organization, we don't pull the plug because we hope that we're the one that's going to crack the code of that mind. I look at every individual is like a city to me. Like their brains are like a city and every city has their own map. And I think sometimes we want to use the same map. I use the map of North Richland Hills in Keller. I'm going to get lost. So I need to make sure that we are targeting the particular person. So you have guys like Justin Turner, guys like I know J.D. Martinez tried to do that with the Red Sox, where you got guys that are so important on the development. You got Michael, Michael Young or or Adrian Beltre, which are almost like uh, another coach in the in the team, and the guys respect them. So when you have guys like that, it changes the whole team. If you don't have guys like that, then you see guys joking for position, or I just want to get mine. And it's so hard to win like that. It's just, it doesn't happen. 
That's that cancer you talk about, right? Somebody being a cancer, you just want to get rid of it. And it's, or some guys need yeah. to change the scenery, right? And then all of a sudden they, they start to flourish, right? And that, that change of scenery for them is a bad life event. I mean, they were comfortable in that environment. They were getting away with stuff. Now they, it's almost like a wake up call. Okay, maybe I know as, as powerful as I think I am, I, I better change my, my habits. And then they become the person, the player that they should have been. And it happens a lot. It happens so many times. And I think some teams don't want to be burned by that. But the best thing sometimes is for a guy to go somewhere else. It's like a coach. I mean, a coach, unless you have, I, I look at it like Sabian or Belichick. I mean, they coach in teams before and they were in as they were in Hall of Fame coaches. They 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 have the the clay to become one but until your players match you i mean i I know we like to say that you know the coach is going to change but you have to have players that like to play the way you coach and when you find that right fit that's when good things you look at rudy with i mean we had hitters they were a bunch of good hitters coming in and out i mean and he makes it so you have a long legacy but then he goes to Chicago. It doesn't happen the same way. You know, it's like, was that Rudy didn't forget how to coach? But he didn't have the 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 type of hitters that that thrive in his in his environment. And it can be frustrating, especially for you guys. Like you said, it's you change the scenery. Um, and I know now, I mean, the coaches are always all over the place, right? Something they don't like it. Instead, you said instead of getting rid of the player, oh, we're just going to fire the coach. And then, right, well, that was his fault. Then he, the coach goes somewhere else, right? The guys there flourish. So, and, you know, like you said, some teams, they don't want that black eye of, yeah. of knowing, well, we cut that guy loose and it, well, it just wouldn't work. I mean, you've, you've seen so, it in other sports as well, correct? Yeah, I saw a, a statistic the other day on the athletic that the average major league hitting coach is like 1.5 seasons. <laughs> it's like insane. I mean, it's like... Really? I mean, I understand what happened with the Rangers. I mean, Chris Jones comes in. I mean, I would have done the same thing. I would try to get my people in, and I'm okay with that. But when when you get rid of four really good coaches and that are very loyal to the organization that want to be here, and then you sign the last year all these players then was it the players or was it or was it the coaches i mean it's like it's confusing and nothing against what the rangers have done i'm just saying they got to do what they think is best for them but i think that and this is stuff that i told them so i, I can you know i, I know I, I think what happens just especially to a hitting coach we are the last one to touch a player but we're the first one to be let go. It's kind of funny and ironic. You know, I didn't sign the player. I didn't acquire the player. I didn't develop the players in the minor leagues. Now we get this product and it's not their fault. I mean, I think every organization is at different stages um, depending on on where they are. If they want to spend money or they want to rebuild or whatever. But the challenge is that a player either can play in the big leagues or, or want. It either can or want. And I can't, is is he ready or he's not ready or he just doesn't belong? Or if he want, is it he doesn't want to, it's more like a mental, it's like an attitude problem. He just doesn't want to be a part of what we're trying to do. And that's always going to be the challenge. And if you're not backed up, I think coaches in the big leagues, the first year coaches in the big leagues, there's a reason why they succeed, I think. Number one is they have some kind of reputation, you know, long in Philadelphia, you know, he wore series with the Yankees. I mean, uh, Washington comes over here. He has this credibility. Then you have a guy that is um, maybe a hitting coordinator, then rebuild. They have all these young guys and they know them. So that might work. And the other one is that the front office and the manager has a strong position and they actually support you. They support behind you. And they know, Cleveland, you know, 
that Tito Francona and the front office are in charge. Tampa, you know who's in charge. So it's easy for the coaches to coach. And that's always going to be the challenge. I mean, organizations is a web and flow. It's like, you know, how, how are we going to, how are we going to win? And, and that, sometimes it, that looks like Frankenstein that was pieced together. Like, yeah. really? How do we put this thing together? How are we going to win this thing? And it's hard. And like you said, it's up. It's got to be, it, like you said, you got, you're almost looking over your shoulder every day, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's pretty sad because I mean, there was two, three other teams that wanted you, and then you make a decision to go here. And then for a lot of our coaches, I mean, I talked to Scott Kulba yesterday. Uh, we are talking about Sander Bogert, and we we're talking about, you know, he wanted some of my insights on him because he's now with San Diego after I had him in, in Boston. And the thing is, it's like, just give us a good reason. You know, like, and okay, like, it's a business, I get it. Um, I just, you know, I've been in different organizations, and it just, it's kind of funny to me that that, that happens, but yeah, but we are used to it. Yeah, but that's what you want, it. though, right? Because you respect, you, you respect Cooley to say, hey, if he asks your opinion, and you'd expect the same thing to be reciprocated, because, right, we're all trying to win. It's not, if you're going to say yeah. something bad about him, you're going to tell him what exactly, you know, what he thinks could be the problem doesn't mean you won't use some right some back pocket techniques when you are facing him correct because that's just that's baseball right we, we've got to figure out a way we can get an advantage but you're right you, that's that's part of it because it, it's it's a fraternity there's a small fraternity of guys that want to they're trying to build trying to succeed but so you want to like you said you want to be able to have those conversations with guys and i'm sure that's not the only one you've had the conversation with also we love the player I mean, that's the thing. Like, we love the player. So we want them to continue to do well. I mean, I even, when I was leaving the Rangers, I, I told them, I said, I, I love these players. I hope that that they allow them to develop to the point that they, if, they, if I was the cause of their, they maybe not performing to what they thought was expectations, at least give them a chance to to do that because you know that's what we do this we don't get paid i mean we don't get paid as much as we should get paid for the role that what we all we have to do so when we have players succeed when you have adolis garcia for example being dfa twice and then he becomes all-star that makes up for the like you know the salary or when you have joy gallo two four years becoming all star like that's that's what you do with the things that you do and it's and you're right it's that it's the mark that you've kind of left on that player right because it would if if you didn't that would be you wouldn't care other than yourself right if you would just say that no you know just black mark that guy as opposed to saying no you know you wish him the best and and, yeah. uh, and, uh, and that's what you want, though, right? Because that's all you want. You, it's this fraternity, you want these guys to, to succeed and do well. But And just, to, you know, it's just that I mean, we don't get, you know, hitting coaches don't get fanfare, right? You're sitting in the dugout hiding. You know, they, it's not like they really point out, oh, there's the hitting coach over there. No, right? You yeah. guys are just hiding. <laughs> also, we play. So there's an empathy there. We remember how tough the game was. And it's even harder now. I mean, we they they get bombarded with so much more stuff than we did. We had a simple life, relatively. It was a hard life, but it was a simpler life. So when you have the empathy, then you know you want them to succeed. You want them to do well. Yeah. So, talking about the empathy and stuff. Talk about a little bit of the of the Dominican style baseball. How these kids. You said you know some of them aren't really educated. And they're plucked from home at what 14, 15. You know, ex explain a little bit about it. I mean, were you you were raised in the U.S. Or were you raised in the Dominican? So I went all the way through high school in the Dominican. Okay. And scholarship to come to college in the states. So I was one of the blessed ones. I mean, sad, such a sad statistic, but I was the first Dominican to play in the big leagues to graduate college. So it's so sad. And now we have a couple more. I think Jose Batista is one of them. Rafael Bornigal is another one. So the list is not long, but at least it's, it's, it's happening. Um, well, the trajectory is, I mean, 
baseball has been for a long time a way of life in the Dominican. So, I mean, my dad is a lawyer in the Dominican, and I made more money that my son only like whatever thirty thousand dollars that he made probably the previous three, four, five years combined. So, it just that's the way it is. You know, you you find you try to look for opportunities to improve your life. And baseball has become that. Now the, the challenge is that it's becoming younger and younger. So now you get a kid that you got to compete with school. You got a kid that might have some talent. The, the younger that they sign there is uh, January 15th. If you're 16 years old, you can sign. So if you are in school for eight hours, seven, eight hours, and sit on the field, well, is you're competing with the developing of the kids. So some some parents, they make the choice. And it's sad that it's happening. And I had thought about some ways that we can maybe meet, mitigate some other stuff, but that's where we at. We have teams making deals with these kids when they're 13 years old, 14 years old, it's sad. And then the chances that some of those kids make is so minimal. So now if you didn't sign a good with a good signing bonus, then you're stuck. So yeah, it, it's it's a big challenge, but also you can't blame them. Yeah, you can't blame me. Maybe the the ticket. Are they? I know when we were playing, they were starting to develop these academies, right? Each team was. Is, does each team now have a presence, an academy now in the Dominican where these kids can go? And is it just purely baseball? Are they actually educating them as well, or is it just baseball only? So every team now, every organization has an academy there. And that had really helped on the treatment of the players. Now, a lot of organizations have an educational program now. Um, either trying to teach them English at the least, or some of them are actually trying to get these kids to get GEDs. Um, you know, it's, it's a challenge because especially if you're a big prospect, you're only going to be there for a year. So for you to finish, it's, it's going to be, uh, it's impossible, but at least they're trying. Um, I had, a I talked to one of the owners one time. I said, look, you know what? I know, I know it's a lucrative business. It's hard to, to change the, the dynamics of it, but if you really want to help the Latin kids, you know, maybe by the year 2028, 20, every Latin kid should have a, whatever, ninth, ninth grade education. Maybe by the year 30, 20, 32, everybody should have 11. I mean, something like that, I make it closer to here because the percentage that, that a Latin player makes it to the big league, it's like, whatever, like 3%, you know, so what are they going to do? What are they going to do when, when they're done with baseball? Do you have guys, uh, any Cuban guys coming over as well? Or, or, uh, is it just, is it only just the Dominican kids that are there in the academies? So the academy, the Dominican Academy is actually the headquarters of international baseball, of the organization. So every, and it's because it's, it's relatively safe. Um, you know, the, Dominicans, they love baseball. They protect these kids. So Venezuelan kids with a political mm -hmm. unrest is there. You know, it's not safe enough to have that. They have mini little academies there where the scouts are looking. But as soon as they have a prospect or they sign, they go to the Dominican. So the Mexican kids go to the Dominican. The Cuban kids, any, any kids from international baseball usually goes to the Dominican and spend a year unless they're given really super high bonus is going to stay in the Dominican at least for a year for the transition to be a little easier when they come to the States. How many kids are in these academies? I mean, is it, are we talking a couple hundred kids? Are we only talking, you know, 20, 30? What is, I mean, how I, I've never been down there. I just hear, I know you told me you were down there a few weeks ago that these guys were, were, you know, scouts were going down. I mean, is it, are these things full or, you know, what's, what's a well, typical day really consist of with them? Depends on the timing. So, Instructional league, um, right before the season, they probably have 100 players just because the kids that were in the States go over there and continue their development. But for the summer, it's probably going to be 60. I mean, you have 
depends on the organization. There's some organizations that have two teams and they might do like a little, they call it tricky league. It's kind of like a rookie league for the really young players that just signed. So they don't want to put them with guys that are, you know, 18, 19 years old. Mm -hmm. And they, they should might have the same kind of team. So they're playing with 16 year olds and, and the transition is a little bit better. Um, but some of the teams that have two teams might have over 100 players there, you know, 100 something players. Yeah. And it's 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 a, it's an interesting thing to see, isn't it? Because of what they're they what they you know what they go through as far as um, you know with that the, the transition that they make from from that. And I mean, are they coming here? Right? You said they come in, they'll play instructional league. Wait, what's the oldest they'll have guys in the academy? Is it is there a certain age where they have to be at? They have to transition out, or is it how's that set up? Yeah. So I think, I mean, so much is the number of years that you've been signed. So, I mean, you might have some guys that might have Tommy Johns or, you know, have been injured for a long time and they might be older and stay there, but they think that they have some potential. Usually, if you're a prospect, you're not going to play more than two years in the Dominican. More than likely, it's going to be one year. And if you had a big bonus, you might come to rookie ball right away and go to extend the spring. But remember, the way baseball works is that you might have two, three, four legitimate prospects, but you can make a team with four guys. So you 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 need the, the rest of the guys to help these three guys develop. The other thing is that you have the signing bonus status have changed. And they've been given a lot more money from when I signed. You know, when I signed, guys were making, you know, two to three thousand dollars. So you have this bow load mentality where you said, okay, I can sign 50 players for the amount that I would pay a second, third round pick. And the chances that three of these guys make is a lot higher than the draft pick that I just got in the state. So you have you have that component too, where you have the, the high end Latin player that they think, Oh, this kid is going to be really, really good. But you sign a lot of players that you see something in them. Maybe they're not as polished. Maybe they, there's something missing. Maybe they get stronger. They surprise you. And then you might hit the lotto. We one of those guys. Yeah. So speaking of that lotto, you're heading here soon to help coach the, uh, Dominican Republic in the World Baseball Classic. What does that mean to you, being a Dominican kid guy, and these guys that have some of these guys, I'm sure, have been through the academies. What does that mean to you, uh, just as a player and as a native Dominican? I mean, now you—I don't know if you consider yourself Dominican or, or a native Texan now. So you've got to figure that one out. Well, I mean, it's just so exciting. I mean, uh, playing in the big leagues. You know, one of the highlights, of course, you know, but I remember playing for the Dominican Pan Am team in Canada. We went to Canada, I think it was with uh, Edmonton or Winnipeg, it was Winnipeg. And I'm telling you, it just, it's another level when you play for your country. And it doesn't matter what you play, though, where it is, it just, the pride and there's a lot of excitement. I mean, these guys want to win it. And I know the U.S. is like, no, we, we're putting a good team to win it. We're supposed to win this thing. So it, it should be fun. I mean, Japan and Korea, they're always so good because they're such team. They, they're, they're, the way they approach it is like the team is the most important. And I think we have learned our lesson. I think early on we put like an all-star team but you realize that all-star teams in those kind of tournaments don't win. So now you have a more balanced team where you, you have, still have the big guys, but but being able to have a team where you have guys in the, at the top that get on base and get in the middle that bring them in and, and then some guys at the, at the bottom that give you some good at-bats. And it just, I mean, I just can't wait. I mean, it's can't wait to be able to see the routines of some of the best players in the world. I mean, you get, you talk about, putting the amount of money that these guys have signed for. I mean, we're probably, I don't know, it's like, like $2 billion worth of players. So it's, it's going to be crazy. I guess they'll be buying you all your meals and everything else while you're, while you're out better. there. 
Yeah, they better. And I think the, the beauty of, of that is the fan bases of how passionate they are, the Dominican fans, you know, the Puerto Rican fans, the Mexican fans of how they travel too, right? You guys are playing, are you guys playing in the U.S. this round? You know, it's been, it's going to be very convenient for us. We all are, our games are going to be in Miami. Okay. So from the beginning all the way, I think the finals is going to be in Miami. So as long as we keep coming forward and even we're going to practice in Fort Myers where the twins are. So it's convenient for me because, you know, the Red Sox are in Fort Myers too. So it helps me out a lot. So I, I can still go to the academy, to our our complex and see our players while still do the Dominican coaching. Yeah, I'm. I'm looking forward to it. when do you when do the, when do you guys actually start? All right, so I'm flying out next Monday, the thirteenth, and our organization will have their meetings the next day. Then a couple of days after that, you know, the Dominican team will start getting together, and the tournament it starts on the tenth. Tenth in in I think in in. Asia and some of the other places where they're playing. And then I think the States, we're going to be on the 11th and it goes 10 days. So the final is on the 21st. Okay. So you're looking forward to it. Like I said, I, I'm, I'm just interested to see how this, how this all plays out. I know this is, this has been new kind of like, you know, the Olympic baseball, but this is, this is different because these guys get bragging rights between them throughout the season, right? You have a couple guys, any Red Sox that are there with you? Is Devers, is he there? Devers. She's going to be there. Okay. So you've got guys that you'll be yeah. around. Yeah. And then Kika Hernandez is going to play for Puerto Rico. And then Verdugo and Duran is going to play for Mexico. So it's going to be fun to, when you get back and hopefully we beat them and we're like, hey, there you go. Yeah. And that's what I think people, the fans understand what what that means as far as just the bragging rights of growing up, of you're around those guys. But this is, it's it's fun. You know, I think it's good for good for them trying to get the baseball on a world stage back to to where it is. Like I said, I listen to more of the, of the fans and their uh, and the chanting and, and everything else. I mean, I just remember playing in Puerto Rico uh, during the season with, with Juan and Pudge and those guys. I mean, the fan, it's just, it's insane. So I just can't imagine, um, you know, the Dominican uh, fans showing up in Miami. Who else is in your, in your, in your division or your bracket? Bracket, we have um, Venezuela, Israel, um, who was it? So I think Colombia, and there's one one other team. Okay, so you know yeah. Venezuelan fans will be will be there. You know, it'll be just yeah. a party in South Beach, right? No, there's nothing better, right? Yeah, L- little salsa, little merengue, hanging out on South Beach. You get a chance just That's to right. re- just to relax. So, well, we wish you best of luck with all that, Luis. We appreciate you jumping on today, and. Uh, they said you should have some good stories to tell when, once the season, once this World Baseball class is over and the season's over when you get back. We'll uh, we'll get out and play some golf. So I'll hopefully get a chance to see you when you guys come into town. Um, I don't know where, when Boston comes here to Texas. So but we wish you luck, man. Appreciate you jumping on here and talking with us. Good luck to you as well. Yes, sir. And uh, and we'll be in touch, man. So good luck to the Dominican Republic, and we'll see uh, see how far you guys can get, and then we will see you during the season. Awesome. I appreciate it, man. Thanks, Luis. All right, talk soon. Yes, sir.